the Snapmaker 2.0, a premium three-in-one manufacturing machine that can be used as a 3D printer, laser cutter, or CNC router. Today we put it through its paces to see if it's worth the price tag. Today, we're looking at the Snapmaker 2.0, which you're seeing here in its bare configuration, because it's modular and can be arranged to be a 3D printer, a laser cutter, or a CNC router. It's not cheap, and the obvious argument against getting one is instead building up three dedicated machines to achieve the same purpose. But I don't think it's quite as simple as that, and it does do some things really well. We've got a lot to get through, so let's get started by examining the specs. We're reviewing a Snapmaker 2.0, and as the name implies, there was an original Snapmaker. The Snapmaker 2.0 is also a modular machine. Depending on how you configure it, running as a 3D printer, laser engraver, or CNC router. The model we're testing today is the largest and most expensive A350, and has a recommended retail price of 1800 US dollars. And for that price, our build volume is a little over 300 millimeters in each direction but there's also smaller and cheaper A250s and A150s. The other thing we're reviewing is the enclosure, which I insisted upon to test the laser safely with my young family around. Again, there's three sizes to match each of the three models, with the largest coming in at 600 US dollars. As you'll see later, it does have quite a bit of functionality built in, such as tinted panels to block out the laser wavelength, magnetic sliding doors, LED strips, and a fan at the back to act as an exhaust. Here are some things worth noting. The Snapmaker 2.0 was a Kickstarter, and as far as I'm aware, all of the rewards have been shipped, and this is a production model. The machine and the enclosure were provided free of charge for the purposes of review after Snapmaker had agreed to my review policy. And yes, it is quite expensive, but in some ways, this is quite justified, as I discovered during unboxing and assembly. This machine came in an enormous box, and inside that was truly boxception, with box after box of various components, and inside those boxes were trays and storage compartments also full of parts. And those parts were extremely high quality, such as this very heavy cast base that all other components attach to, and each of those parts is also beautiful. Solid metal, anodized in a gunmetal grey finish, and it's like this all throughout the machine with these two parts here making up the filament holder, which matches everything else. Also beautiful is the printed quick start guide, which seems more like an Ikea glossy magazine rather than an instruction manual. It covers the general assembly of the machine, as well as how to configure it for the three modes, the images are high quality, the diagrams are well labeled and very logical, with safety warnings where necessary, Quite frankly, it's the best set of instructions I've ever used in a review, and it made putting the machine together a pleasure. The assembly process to get to the base configuration took around about an hour or so. And thanks to the instructions and the design of the parts, it was easy to do this without making mistake. The only part I didn't like was the cable management on the underside of the machine, which was cumbersome compared to most other aspects. Now that the base machine is together, let's have a closer look at some of the details. There are five motion components that make up the three axes of movement, and they're all identical. Inside each is a stepper motor, a greased lead screw, and an end stop. Everything sealed with the aim of keeping dust and debris on the outside. The electronics control box is mounted vertically on the back of the machine, and each of the ports has this little rubber dust cover, including the port for the USB flash drive, which is one option for starting your jobs. To control the machine, we have this high resolution color touchscreen that's on a magnetic mount so you can remove it and hold it in a convenient manner. For me, this is one of the highlights of the machine. It looks and feels like a really high-end smartphone and it is in fact powered by Android. It also has wireless connectivity, which means you can remotely control the printer, but it also makes things like firmware updates incredibly easy. In one of the boxes are the three heads for the three different functions. The first is our 3D printing head, and it has a direct drive, PTFE lined hot end, and built-in part cooling. The CNC spindle has the same form factor, the motor can go up to 12,000 RPM, and uses an ER11 collet. Finally, the laser module has a 1600 milliwatt, 450 newton meter diode laser, 
and there's also a camera on the underside and an LED to light the work environment as well. In another box, we have all of the work platforms for the three different functions. For 3D printing, we have a heated PCB with a magnetic spring steel sheet. For CNC, we have an MDF spoil board with lots of threaded inserts for holding down your workpiece. And for laser cutting, we have these metal extrusions that allow air to circulate underneath your material. I started by configuring the machine as a 3D printer, and four bolts are used on the back of the print head to secure it to the gantry. After this, the flat cable is plugged into the print head and then into the control board which is labelled accordingly. The heated PCB then lowers onto the bed frame with M4 countersunk short bolts used to hold it down. There are over 20 of these so it is going to take you a while to strap it down. Like the print head, the heated PCB plugs into the control box which is labelled once more. Finally, our print surface can be installed, it's magnetic, double sided and the coating is very similar to BuildTac. The production quality of these parts is quite simply beautiful and I made a preview video for my patrons where I gushed over the machine and I've linked that for you in the description below. Before we move on to 3D printing, we need to have a look at the software that's used for all three modes called Luban. If we head to support and then download on the Snapmaker website, we'll find the download page for Snapmaker Luban and this is the preferred software to be used for 3D printing, laser and CNC. As you can see, it's multi-platform and it's also open source with the source being available on the Snapmaker GitHub. We start by setting which machine we're using from the drop-down menu. And if you really wanna try this out without a Snapmaker, you can see there's an option for a custom machine too. Along the left-hand side, we have our different modes. By default, you'll be in 3D printing mode, but we also have laser mode as well as CNC. Down the bottom we also have a library where we can load the files for tutorial projects. Up the top we have the option for the workspace and you should consider this as the interface for direct control like you would use for Octoprint or Pronterface. For beginners we have inbuilt slicing profiles for PLA and ABS. We also have presets for fast, normal or high quality and if you want to customize you can click on that and then we have a Cura style interface where we can change some parameters. For my 3D print testing, I used these presets and I found they worked pretty well. And for my first test print, the 3D Benchy, I exported the G-code to the USB thumb drive. So I was ready to 3D print and that would soon highlight some of my main issues with the unit. The appearance of this machine is beautiful and refined, but the same thing can't be said about the sound. The power supplier is standalone and even at idle, it's quite loud, just under 60 decibels. Moving on, this machine with the 3D printing head in place has auto bed leveling inbuilt. This process needs to be run anytime you reconfigure the machine for 3D printing, but as you'll see later on, it needs to be done more often than that. You can't do it automatically before every print because the final point involves setting the Z offset with a piece of paper. After starting a print job from the flash drive, the machine then homes, moving the gantry up to the top of the Z axis before parking itself back down the bottom for the heaters to heat up. And this brings us to problem two, which fortunately only applies to when you're 3D printing. And that is the heated bed is quite slow to heat up, taking six and a half minutes to reach 70 degrees. When the print finally started, problem number one reared its head again. <laughs> Noisy stepper motors, and it's been a long time since I reviewed anything that didn't have silent stepper motor drivers. And this machine is definitely not silent. Such a premium machine let down by such loud and unsophisticated operation. It's a total own goal. Despite this, however, the prints were actually quite respectable. Let's have a look at this Benchy printed on the fast preset with 0.24 millimeter layer height which makes it look a little bit coarse, but the layer stacking and the part cooling is actually quite clean. You can even read the 3D Benchy text on the back of the boat. All of the fine details are there, there's no stringing, all in all, it's quite a clean print. Next up, this support free Mandalorian figure, picked for its detail and decoration. And the printer did not disappoint. Once again, this is on the fast preset, and I want you to pay attention to the steep overhang at the bottom of the cape, 
which was almost flawless apart from one spot. It's a handsome print, printed in the one kilogram roll of PLA that was included. Next was the Thwack version 3 remix, based on the Thwack 3D printed hammer. This is the only print I've ever done with 100% infill. Another clean print on the fast preset, and something you might have seen in my previous video on 3D printed workshop tools. This whole horror test was created by one of my patrons, so I printed it on the Snapmaker with the high quality preset. A lack of any stringing means the retraction is on point, and I was also able to use it with calipers to verify the dimensional accuracy. Any new slicer needs a test of vase mode, so I scaled up this twisted hexagon vase to take up most of the available build volume. Vase mode prints are a great way to test extrusion consistency, and I'm happy to report that the Snapmaker passed this test without issue. The bed is particularly grippy however, and it snapped the vase as I tried to flex it off. As I alluded to earlier, the auto bed leveling seems to drift off over time, causing one side to be too close and the other too high. I stopped the print and ran the probing process once more. This resulted in perfect first layers once again, so this step will be somewhat regular. The other thing I tried during these prints was to connect via Wi-Fi mode, which gives you access to a console and manual controls in Luban. You can move the printer around, heat the heaters and remove or add filament, but the downside is while you're connected, it locks you out of controls from the touchscreen interface. You also have to be next to the machine to both connect the Wi-Fi and to start any print jobs. The machine is noisy and it's slow to heat, but the prints are actually quite slow too. We're talking 12 and a half hours for the vase on fast preset and eight hours for the torture test on the high quality preset. Inconveniences aside, the PLA prints look pretty good. So how about some other filaments? Levendig Design sell these extension cables for the Prusa Mini. When you combine this with a new printed case, it allows you to move the input for the USB drive to a more convenient spot. I printed this one with orange PETG using the ABS preset. PETG sticks well to the bed, and with some retraction tuning, this printer should be able to handle it with no issues. Next up, this rectangular storage box, which I decided to print from TPU. Because the printer's already moving so slow, all I had to do was adjust temperatures in the slicer. Once again, this is based on the ABS profile, so the retraction needs tuning to get rid of the stringing, but clearly this extruder and hot end combo has no trouble printing with flexibles. For ABS, I printed some drawers from the Bumblebee Spool Storage Remix. This design was featured on a previous video where I converted a bunch of old spools to storage for my garage workshop. The ABS preset is only heated to around 235, which wasn't hot enough and caused a lot of layer splitting. To fix this, I copied and saved my own profile, upping the temperature to 255, and I assembled and printed inside the enclosure which holds a steady 36 degrees without any external heaters being added. And the results were greatly improved. Not perfect, but this filament is quite old and quite prone to warping and splitting. Depending on your climate, you might not even need an enclosure to print ABS. But next up, we're testing the laser and I would strongly recommend an enclosure for that. So let's have a closer look. This Snapmaker enclosure is probably more complicated than you think. It's heavy, it's got a lot of parts, and as such, it took me almost as long as the main machine to assemble. Aiding this was another dedicated high quality instruction manual, and I also give this one a 10 out of 10. The enclosure has easy access on the front and one of the sides, where you can flip open a single panel or slide the whole lot out of the way. It can catch, however, if you don't pull it exactly in the middle. The spool holder is moved to the back corner of the enclosure, and that makes feeding filament through and into the top of the hot end a little bit challenging, especially if you've got short arms. The power supply stays outside to keep it cool and free of dust, and the enclosure, once plugged into the main machine, is automatically recognized and offers a menu item where you can control the LED lights, as well as the exhaust fan on the back, which comes with high quality ducting suitable for fume extraction. Again, not cheap, but it is a crucial safety addition to protect your eyes as well as extracting smoke and fumes. Crucially, you can also opt to have the laser or spindle cut out when the door is opened, thanks to a magnetic switch inbuilt. Let's reconfigure the machine to use the laser. Before you start, I'd recommend moving the print head into a more convenient location, especially if you're using the enclosure. 
you can then power down and undo the four bolts on the back of the 3D printing head, bolt on the laser head in its place, and connect it to the control box using the same cable. Those 22 screws that hold on the 3D printer bed now need to be removed one by one before we insert the extrusions that make up the bed for when we laser engrave. Securing these to the base with some more bolts, only 14 this time, it does seem like a bit of a pain, but you can swap between modules in under 10 minutes. When you power up, the machine will recognize that the laser module has been fitted and give you some safety warnings. We then have a calibration wizard where we measure some sacrificial material, place it onto the bed. The designated tool for this is these little silicon plugs. You can probably tell here that I find them really fiddly. They're just a little bit cumbersome to plug in between the gaps in the extrusion. They do work however, and if you don't like them, you can use tape or binder clips. We now continue the wizard by entering the thickness of our sacrificial material and manually moving the head of the laser down until it just touches the material. The machine will then draw a series of lines with slightly differing heights. This is to compare different focal lengths, which it does by raising up and using its inbuilt camera to determine the best one automatically. We then calibrate the camera by inserting a blank piece of paper. The machine then engraves a squarish pattern before using its inbuilt camera once again to automatically complete this calibration. When setting up a laser, there's two crucial things to get you started. The first is knowing the correct focal length, and this is done in a very clever way. The second is knowing which speed, power, and the amount of passes needed for any given material. I only found this by searching the forums, but there is a dedicated page for just this that lists all of the materials recommended to be used with the laser module and provides starting feed rates, passes, and power for each one. This is an ideal resource for getting started and an excellent basis for fine tuning. Whenever you're setting up a job, you can reference the web page and copy over the settings to get you started. And that's what I did for all of my testing. My first test cut was very simple and I used the inbuilt camera to great effect. It builds up an array of images of the bed and that means I could see the piece of paper still left behind from the camera calibration. If you need to, you can make a quick adjustment to get the camera perfectly aligned and then you can use this image to place and scale your artwork. This is the exact same workflow I use with Lightburn on my CO2 laser cutter. Trust me when I say that it's a winner. We now input the material thickness on the left hand side and hit the play button in the upper left. The machine will now commence work, and back in Luban, we get a real-time progress display. Teaching Tech logo complete, and we're off to a successful start. Next, I loaded up the laser cut gift box, and you can see a bug here that happened any time I imported a 2D image. It seemed to be about 10% of the size that it should be. I used the tutorial page to scale it to the correct size, and positioned it using the camera on the supplied 1.5mm thick plywood. As you can see, like the 3D printing, it's not exactly fast. This entire job taking over an hour. Despite the plywood being a bit warped, it still cut through pretty cleanly. I was able to push out the pieces and assemble the gift box without the use of any glue. Next up, corrugated cardboard, using a free piece of software called Slicer for Fusion, which I've covered before and turns 3D objects into 3D puzzles. The source file was this rubber ducky, and using the recommended settings from the web page, using three passes, it took roughly two and a half hours to cut this from five millimeter cardboard. When it was done, I was able to pop the pieces out pretty cleanly, consult the animated assembly instructions in the software and put it together to have something quite unique. Next up, this open source logo to test cutting and engraving at the same time. And this exposed a limitation with Luban where when you import graphics, you can't break them up into individual components. Therefore, I had to use an external graphics program to export it twice, so I had one layer for cutting and another for engraving. This one I started from the screen rather than the camera, and that involves setting the thickness of the material, and then jogging the laser into the middle of the workpiece and setting the origin. This one was pretty quick, a little over 10 minutes, and that's because I used the packaging foam that came with the machine. The result was pretty good, and you could make some nice things using this material. Finally, using the laser to engrave an image. And long-term viewers know that Chuck Norris usually makes an appearance around now, and I couldn't see any reason to deviate. There's a few different modes available, and I opted for grayscale. Once again, taking my engraving settings for MDF from the website. 
There's also some sliders for brightness and contrast, and as you'll see, I got these wrong. I loaded up the preview, started the job, and began waiting. And the next day, I was still waiting. In fact, this job took 30 hours to complete. It was large, and I did have it set to dark, so a lighter image would be much quicker. Chuck probably enjoys this amount of stealth hiding in the dark, but even if he doesn't, hopefully you can see the potential of laser engraving images with this machine. So laser mode, pretty good, especially using the inbuilt camera for positioning, just a little bit slow. It's worth noting that there are small gaps in the enclosure, so it's all right to look from a distance, but I'd recommend the glasses when inspecting up close. Let's turn our attention to some CNC routing. We firstly need to fit the CNC spindle using the same four bolt system as the other two heads. And then we need to insert the MDF spoil board, which has got a bunch of threaded inserts for holding down your workpiece. Once again, there's many bolts to hold this in place, but the whole thing can be done in under 10 minutes. Like with the laser module, when the machine turns on, it recognizes the CNC spindle is attached and gives us some safety warnings. For my first job, I followed one of the online tutorials to make an acrylic phone stand. Importing the geometry into Luban, copying over the feeds and speeds, and inspecting the simulation preview, which is a nice feature of this software. It's called a spoil board, but I still don't like to spoil them. Packing the piece of acrylic up on some spare acrylic, just like I do on my aluminium topped machine in the garage. The workpiece holding clamps are made in the same way as the rest of the machine, and they're almost too pretty to use for this purpose. An alternative for larger pieces are drilling holes through the workpiece and using low profile M4 bolts. As mentioned earlier, we have an ER11 collet, which is far superior to a chuck like on a drill, and we use it to secure our cutter. It has a 3.175 millimeter shank the same as you'll find for many cheap tools, including those on a Dremel. For CNC jobs, we need to position them manually, which means jogging the machine until the cutter is in the center of the workpiece and lowering it down until a piece of paper is trapped. After this, we can use the LCD to outline the extremities of the job and make sure there's gonna be no collisions. We then hit go and wait for the job to complete, this demo job taking around 45 minutes. Afterwards, we'll need to vacuum up any debris Break the tabs holding the pieces into the sheet of acrylic and that means there'll be some sharp bits that we need to trim off and then we slot the pieces together to form a tablet or phone stand. So we're off to a good start but I was soon to discover some limitations in the CNC mode of Luban. Luckily free alternatives are available. My next test piece was this Spurgy created in Onshape exported in STL format but once I imported it into Luban it was coming up as a grayscale image not the 3D STL like you would have when 3D printing. Looking at the preview and simulation showed this was gonna give quite a crude result with zigzag material removal rather than a clean outline. I exported as a DXF and imported that into Luban, setting up for a custom cutter. These on the path tool paths look okay, but when we look at the simulation, we can see that the part will be undersized. So what we really need is a tool path to go around the outline of the part but when we preview that, we can see that we have this mess with a matching simulation result. I looked at the G code and copied the start and end G code, as well as deleting any tool change G code into Kirimoto, which is free and cloud based CAM. Here we can see the correct tool paths offset from the outside of the object by the radius of the cutter to leave the correct shape behind. The G code ran without any issues whatsoever and produced a fairly clean part. Ignore the center hole, that was my fault for having the toolpaths in the incorrect order. Unlike with laser cutting, there's no online reference to know the correct feeds and speeds when you're using the CNC function. With this in mind, when testing other materials, I was very conservative with my feeds and speeds, but was still able to mill some aluminium, but only removing a quarter of a millimeter with each pass. Even so, the job was successful, and with a little cleanup, you'll be able to make usable aluminium parts. Machining PCBs also isn't a problem using a V engraving bit. This was my first attempt. I could probably tune the depth a little bit better, but the potential is there. I also wanted to experiment with machining a 2D image in 3D, but when loading it into Luban, the resolution setting didn't seem to have any effect. Even so, I still ran the G-code, carving one out in a big hunk of wood, and then I processed the same file in some CAM software to show the extra control you have over resolution. 
As expected, the version machined from Luban is pretty blocky and you can see a lot of stair stepping in between the paths. Whereas the version done on Desproto still has some issues, but I could further turn up the resolution if I wanted it to be completely smooth. Once again, if you're patient and keep your expectations reasonable owing to the rigidity of the machine, you can successfully mill a variety of materials. The enclosure did contain the dust and debris well, but it was a big job to clean it as thoroughly as necessary to be able to 3D print again. Summary time. It took me a long time to review this machine, mainly because the jobs were long and they were loud. I had to fit the jobs in between recording other videos where of course I need silence. However, this may not be a consideration at all for you, but it's just something to keep in mind. It's just a shame such a beautiful machine doesn't have the quiet refinement to match. If you can look beyond this, the machine does work as advertised. Using pre-made profiles, I was able to 3D print quite well in PLA. The laser function with the camera positioning was effective and the CNC fairly capable, albeit with needing third-party software to make the most of the hardware. So back to the original question, the Snapmaker 2.0 versus three dedicated machines. Yes, you could build up a 3D printer, a CO2 laser and a CNC router for less money, and they would each probably be more specialized and therefore more capable. But not everyone has the time, expertise or energy to do this. When you think about it, it's the same reason most people just buy a car, rather than tinkering in their garage, building up a project car. Other machines typically don't have the aesthetics and build quality of the Snapmaker 2 either. And for some people that's a moot point, but for others it's quite important. Have some perspective and remember that many people spend big bucks on iPhones when a basic Android phone essentially has the same functions. Everyone is allowed to have their own preference with some people preferring a premium style and others focusing on no fuss practicality. If you can afford it and are aware of the limitations, this Snapmaker could definitely make someone happy and allow them to create some really cool projects. But that's just my opinion. And before spending any money, I'd recommend watching other reviews like the one from CNC Kitchen on this machine. As for your opinion, no doubt you'll let me know what that is down below in the comment section. Thank you so much for watching and until next time, happy 3D printing, laser engraving and CNC routing. G'day, it's Michael again. If you like the video, then please click like. If you want to see more content like this in future, click subscribe and make sure you click on the bell to receive every notification. If you really want to support the channel and see exclusive content, become a patron. Visit my Patreon page. See you next time.